so here we are in notes two, um, the PDF number two, on the um, third page of it, I think. Um, there's a little bit uh, there um, at first in notes two about um, how velocity anomalies at different depths will appear on a, um, a section, <clears throat> a 2D section of uh, M and H. And uh, now we go into a discussion of the effect of dip on the um, uh, arrival times of, uh, of reflections. So um, it's essentially the presence of dipping structure that ensures that a uh, CMP stack section is not a zero offset section. I hope one thing I've impressed you with is, is that um, a uh, CMP stack is kind of a uh, Low dip filtered version of the zero offset section. All right, and uh, as a result, it doesn't migrate things uh, quite uh, quite correctly, and doesn't represent the structure and the geometry of the structure uh, in with as much detail and as much completeness as you want. Let's look at the signature of uh, of different sorts of gathers uh, from two end member structures. Okay. Just to, you know, the first thing I like to do when I'm considering a, a phenomenon is I'll consider what happens when the phenomenon is null, not present, and when the phenomenon is, is at its extreme. So um, for dip, there's two extremes. There's, um, uh, there's flat. So in the uh, model depth section on the left, uh, you see... Um, you see uh, x and uh, and z are the coordinates, and uh, you're standing here next to midpoint to number m zero, and the um, below you is uh, is v zero, and below that below an interface is v one. The interface is flat. The other section down below, the um, the dip is. Um, is almost 90 degrees. Not quite 90 degrees, but almost 90 degrees. Okay, um, maybe it's uh, 85 degrees. So that's uh, uh, kind of a, you know, we, we might expect, you know, we don't we don't design our our um, our typical seismic reflection survey to be able to recover uh, reflections uh, from structures that are dipping at 90 degrees. Uh, but it's barely possible, and um, it's a little more possible for an 85 degree dipping reflector. Uh, and really, a lot of this, uh, a lot of what this class is about, is maybe it's important to go ahead and design our surveys to be able to collect data from steeply dipping structures like this, very steeply dipping structures, uh, because uh, like in the basin and range. That's where our geothermal reservoirs are. That's uh, that's uh, uh, the edges of our basins. That's really what defines the some of the most prominent reflectors in our uh, in our section, and certainly some of the most important reflectors in our sections. Uh, faults, in other words. So um, uh, let's look at the flat dip case first. Uh, we should know exactly what's going on here. We have a uh, convent point gather, you know, taken around M zero, and so we've got uh, you know large positive H uh, or pos positive H increasing to the right, negative H, you know, decreasing to still getting larger to the uh, um, to the left, and so we see a uh, uh, reflection hyperbola, um, which we should be completely comfortable with. Uh, it uh, has its uh, zero offset time at uh, at a minimum time, which I'll call t zero, as you'll see. And um, the hyperbola is asymptotic to the slope one over v zero in this in this uh, C and P gather section. In a constant h or zero h section, okay. So here for for uh, h uh, um, h equal to zero, okay. So this is a zero offset section on the right-hand side here. Um, it's a straight line, as you'd expect. Uh, you know, it the, the reflection from that flat layer arrives at uh, t equals t zero, that uh, minimum offset time, 
uh, or zero offset time for all n. Okay, just what you'd expect. Now, what happens for the 90 degree dipping reflector? I guess I better leave this here to uh, for contrast. All right. Uh, well, this is weird, um, and you can uh, you know do the geometry and figure it out. But basically, if we're close to um, uh, you know, for more than 85 degrees dip in a CMP gather, okay, uh, the arrival time of the reflection, uh, you know, and we're observing from uh, M0 here, and it's dipping, uh, it's dipping just slightly towards uh, the midpoint we're observing around, okay, the, um, the arrival time for every offset is the same. T equals T zero, and if you think about how you know the uh, uh, you know you open up the offset and the source goes back here and the receiver goes up here and the uh, the wave is traveling uh, pretty much horizontally the reflection wave is traveling pr pretty much horizontally you know so uh, from zero offset we get one time we get this, that zero offset time you know to the right and then back to the left. And if we put the source to the left and the, the receiver an equal amount to the equal distance h to the right, we're going to have the same, uh, dis same total distance, okay, and thus the same time. So uh, maybe that's something to start to accommodate ourselves to, is that in the CMP gather, um, when we have the maximum dip, we're going to have a flat reflection, arrives the same time at every midpoint. Now, uh, before you uh, before you ask, um, I'm going to tell you that this is is of course just for the case where all the sources and receivers from that about that uh, midpoint M zero uh, are on the same side of the fault. You go over the fault, and you know something else happens. Okay. Shouldn't the arrival come sooner as the receiver moves towards the fault? Yeah, but the source is moving away from the fault. But the source only has to move as a one-way time, but the receiver would be a two-way time distance. So well, we well, think about the think about the situation. We start here at the source. Yeah. Okay. We go, you know, the distance from M zero to the fault plus h. Okay. We bounce off the fault. We come back horizontally to the receiver, which is the distance to the fault from M zero minus h. So you add the two together, and it, st it stays the same. OK, well here's another piece of weirdness for you to uh, wrap, your, wrap your heads around. It took me a long time to figure this out. Um, in a zero offset gather, and in fact in any constant h uh, gather, this vertical reflector is not vertical. Okay, It's actually going to appear. And, and here's the, the midpoint, you know, right there where the uh, where the reflector daylights. Um, in the zero offset reflector, the um, um, the uh, uh, at the in the zero offset section, the reflection is a straight line, but it's not vertical. It's at slope one over v zero. Just like the flat one is asymptotic to one over v zero in the uh, um, in the CMP gather. All right, so these are the n member situations. You know, a dip of forty five degrees is going to be more or less halfway in between. All right, uh, any dipping bed in two dimensions. Okay, that there you know you have uh, beds that are dipping off line or cross line, and there's you know. Other things that happen as well, but in two dimensions or for um, you know dip lines and cylindrically symmetrical uh, geology, um, you know that has uh, uh, constant strike and we're at our two D survey is is always on the dip line. Okay, in this situation, we'll get sections that are in between the two here. So um, even a very steep reflector cannot produce. A CMP gather with the arrival at a negative move out. Okay, um, if you've looked at, uh, you know, certainly any of my data sets from the uh, Great Basin, um, you will have seen uh, reflections that are at negative 
move out. Diffractions, reflections at negative move out. In other words, the wave is propagating back towards the source. That's because you're looking in shot gather, not in CMP gather. Okay. So um, let's uh, uh, let's use our uh, midpoint offset coordinates, and you know get a travel time equation uh, and a an NMO equation for um, uh, for the uh, um, for the uh, uh, the dipping bed. Okay. So uh, I'll write it uh, like this. Um, M is the the M we're observing from. Uh, M zero is the uh, uh, the midpoint uh, that uh, the uh, dip the dipping bed daylights at. So it's actually just a slightly different. It's not exactly this diagram here. Okay. Um, and um, uh, we have uh, t squared v squared. Uh, and this is constant velocity, of course. Four times uh, uh, m minus m zero squared, quantity squared times sine squared alpha, which is the dip, plus four h squared, cosine squared alpha. Okay. Uh, now, for in a CMP gather, m is fixed and h varies. So, uh, you know, we kind of uh, you know, m minus m zero is going to be a constant, and we'll just absorb that into here as a delta m. So then t squared, trying to make it look like the NMO equation, right? t squared is uh, 4 delta m squared over v squared times uh, sine squared alpha plus 4h squared times the ratio of cosine squared alpha over v squared. OK? So if I take uh, this uh, first term here as t0, uh, squared, okay. So t zero and and you can see the mistake I made, right? T zero itself is two times delta m over v times sine uh, alpha, okay. And so that's a constant for this um, for this uh, uh, um, uh, that's a constant for this uh, dipping uh, 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 for the CMP gather, okay. Um, and what do we have in the second term here? Well, that turns out to be the, the real key. Uh, it's 4h squared over um, uh, what looks like uh, an apparent velocity squared. Okay. So, so this, uh, this here, this double starred equation here, is uh, just the hyperbolic NMO equation. Okay. It's an exact equation for constant velocity. Uh, no, there's no uh, simplifications. Uh, well, there's a lot of simplifications, but there's no approximations here. And the um, the NMO equation is um, uh, that you're familiar with for zero dipping uh, events is like this. So really, the difference is in the calculation of t zero, and also in in you know what is this apparent velocity v sub a p um, or v sub a if you like. Uh, the apparent velocity is the real velocity divided by the cosine of the dip. Okay, so um, is the uh, apparent velocity uh, uh, going to be um, um, uh, greater than or less than the uh, the real velocity, v? Yeah, equal or greater, right? And when is it equal to v? Exactly. All right. So it reduces to the standard NMO equation here, right? We have, um, uh, and so does you know we have sine alpha here, and um, so um, uh, for for uh, um, uh, well actually it doesn't quite reduce because uh, we don't have delta m. We have to use the depth in calculating t zero when we don't have dip, right? If we if dip is zero, then the bed never daylights, and delta m is uh, essentially infinite. So uh, you know then of course uh, uh, to reduce this to the standard animal equation for zero dip, we have to use uh, something other than delta m. Well, wouldn't the sine make that term zero? 
Yeah, yeah, and but but delta m goes to infinity, so you know that's why we can't use it. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's the key. Um, basically, what this what this equation is saying is that the um, a dipping bed stacks in at a high apparent velocity. So when I, you know, when I tell my class, uh, my seniors, uh, and the uh, uh, the geological engineers, when I tell them that, um, okay, we're going to figure out that uh, you have picked at a velocity that gives a ridiculous, uh, um, you picked reflections at a at a velocity that shows the reflections very well, but gives a ridiculous um, uh, Dick's interval velocity. Because the the apparent velocity, because the the uh, NMO velocities are too high, okay, and you're getting you know uh, interval velocities of twenty thousand meters per second or something, you know, uh, maybe physically possible but uh, not really very reasonable. Uh, I say, you know, so you want to know when you're violating that, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't stack it at that high velocity anyway. It's just a dipping layer that you're uh, that you're faced with. Okay, so um, uh, you know the the asymptote the asymptote of the uh, common midpoint gather is uh, is at at this v uh, this v apparent and not and that's higher than the uh, the true velocity depending on the cosine of the dip alpha. Okay, so as dip increases, apparent velocity increases. Um, Let's see. Uh, and the first star, yeah. This is a um, this this basic travel time equation for a dipping layer. It's also a hyperbola for a constant offset section. You could render this, you know, for constant h, and you'll get a hyperbola where this is essentially the t zero, and uh, this now is the uh, um, is the move out. You know, coming from the first term instead of the second term. Okay, so for a constant offset section, uh, you still get a hyperbola. You just have to state it differently. All right, now Clairbout shows this wonderful example of uh, point scatterers and uh, an attempt to understand, uh, uh, you know, what what you know. Basically, uh, if you have a ball bearing um, down, you know, buried below the um, uh, in the section. Or a um, um, or a tunnel, uh, a void, a bubble. Um, that ball bearing, that that um, that point scatterer, essentially contains all dips, right? At the top of the bubble, you've got zero dip. At the uh, at the sides of the bubble, you've got ninety degree dip, right? So if we could figure out if we could figure out how a point scatterer Reflects and what time the reflection is going to come in, then we can figure out anything because any structure is just, you know, a uh, uh, in in, in uh, now I'm forgetting the name uh, in, in, under Huygens' principle, you can make any structure out of a combination of point scatterers, you know, a line of dots, if you like. So we have uh, we have mo. We have the location uh, on the x-axis of the uh, the point scatterer. So the point scatterer is at x and depth z. Okay, here's two different point scatterers at different x's and different z's. Okay, we have our source location on the x-axis s, and our receiver location on the x-axis g, um, the midpoint m zero, um, and uh, offset h. Here's the full, uh, you know. The, as you can see, very simple Pythagorean theorem. Okay, uh, this is the three-star equation. Um, in the uh, in common midpoint, we're going to find that uh, what we have are hyperbolas or hyperboloids, sometimes even becoming triangles, uh, you know, or A's anyway. Um, the top uh, slanted parts of a triangle, uh, and they're all centered at. Which I haven't drawn very well, but they're all centered at zero h. That's in the common midpoint gather, 
in the constant offset gather or the zero offset gather, uh, they're again all hyperbolas sometimes or these flattened hyperboloids. All right, that's what this equation describes. So this response is important, um, and uh, uh, let's try to understand it in the terms of our stacking chart. So we have a um, uh, uh, again uh, we ha uh, we're in a two D world, right? This obviously this equation is only two dimensions, right? So you introduce uh, the y direction, and you've got to add another another term to the to the uh, Pythagorean solution here. Um, you know, so you could explore that. Um, so we're, we can, but since we're looking at two D, and that's all we're trying to understand right now, two D world, um, we're going to locate this point scatterer somewhere on the m axis, right? It's going to it's going to have a depth as well, and um, uh, so. I'm going to put this, uh, here's the m axis, and here's the h axis. And then here also in the same stacking chart is the s coordinate axis and the g coordinate axis. Okay, And, um, and then here are the directions. These are not arrows pointing to certain places. These are, the, these are arrows pointing out the direction of constant x sections in, in some way. Um, so as you uh, as you may be familiar from uh, our, our work last time with with the um, um, uh, our work last time with the uh, um, uh, with a stacking chart uh, vertically here that's a constant receiver section constant G section horizontally that's the constant shot section constant source section horizontal. Uh, in this direction, following the m-axis, that's a constant offset section. Of course, the zero offset section is right along the m-axis here. And then um, uh, perpendicular to that and following the h-axis are all the constant m sections, all the common midpoint gathers. Okay. Now, what are we looking at here? We're looking down into uh, at, at the 3D it's like uh, uh, we have a, a glass tabletop here, and the axes are marked on it. And we're looking down at a at a model of the. Um, um, and I probably ought to have this three D printed. Actually, I could do that. <laughs> um, the um, we're looking down at a model of the of the travel time surface. Okay, in this space. So the time axis. Is extending back into the screen. Okay, it's going back into the screen. The uh, the S, G, and M and H axes they're all right on top of the glass tabletop, you know. And the time axis is going down, you know, underneath the table. And at some point, uh, uh, what we see is this kind of rounded pyramid. Um, and the degree of roundness and degree, the degree of flatness of the sides varies. On the uh, uh, depth of the uh, of the scatterer, um, and what I tried to indicate here, these are contour lines. So the minimum time is right at the apex of the pyramid, uh, the point of the pyramid, and then we have contour lines of increasing time. And you can see the little bars, you know, the little barbs on the contour lines are pointing down, uh, you know, down further underneath the table to larger time. Okay, um, so uh, let's um, you know any any uh, any scatterer. <coughs> you know here's a here's a basically a, just one example scatterer. All right, so uh, in a common midpoint gather, well let's see we start with with constant offset gathers. So uh, notice that for a zero offset gather, you know no matter what you do. You have a, uh, a hyperbola, but if you have a constant offset gather that's not zero offset, notice that you can come up the side of the pyramid a little bit, come around that rounded corner, and then run along, you know, parallel to the contours. So that's how you get this flattened hyperboloid. Okay, that's going to look like a flattened hyperboloid. 
And the uh, same thing can happen in a in a common midpoint gather. If you're notice, if you're right over the scatterer, if your midpoint is directly over the scatterer, then uh, that common midpoint gather has a hyperbola, a perfect hyperbola. But if the scatterer is is not at the midpoint that you've you've put in here, um, then you know you come up the side of the pyramid, you come around the rounded corner, and then you run along parallel to the uh, to the contour the time contours for a while. So uh, another flattened hyperbola. So what what Clairbout did here is is uh, and I you know I've got to get the code to generate this, which is I'm sure in his new book. Um, is he uh, he put a uh, I don't know if there's 50 or 100 uh, randomly placed scatters in this 2D section, and here's a common midpoint section. Okay, so the ones uh, the ones that are more rounded are are I'm sorry this is a this is a uh, on top a constant offset section. Okay, um, and it's a 2D section, so you know you ought to be able to figure out where every single scatterer is. The ones that are deeper have the larger times at their apex, and um, and you'll notice also they're more rounded. The ones that are shallower have the the flattened tops, or notice they can be very sharp. They can be very sharply, uh, um, you know, sharp these sharp triangles. Okay. So um, uh, why is the uh, now notice that nothing appears at zero time, and there are some very very shallow scatters in this uh, in this collection. Well, nothing's at zero time because h is constant and not zero. It's got some finite uh, you know it's a finite offset section, so there is some minimum travel time, you know because there's a, a minimum offset, you know which is which is this h constant offset. Okay. Let's uh, let's look at a um, a common midpoint gather. All right, I'll, I'll go to the the middle one here first or second. All right, um, the ones that are um, uh, the ones that are nice hyperbolas. Of course, you know the thing. The first thing to notice here is that all the hyperbolas, all the hyperboloids, whatever shape they are, they are all very nicely centered around um, zero offset. That's this axis. You know, the, they're centered around the time axis here at zero offset. And notice they're all asymptotic to the same constant velocity. So even even in the case where um, where we we have um, uh, where we don't have a good hyperbola, where we have one of these you know severely flattened hyperbolas. And the flattening comes about because the scatter is located at a midpoint that's different from the midpoint that we're taking this gather from. Okay, so so that we get this flattened hyperbola, we could still estimate the velocity, right? If we don't if we don't bother to, you know, notice that the time it comes in is is you know it's not a vertical it's not a vertical travel time it's really a horizontal travel time. Uh, so the you know. If you if you take the the minimum time of that reflection and you calculate a um, and you calculate a depth, you're going to be way off. It's going to come out, you know, way deeper than it really is. Okay, uh, but if you determine velocity based on the uh, uh, on the the legs of this hyperboloid, you know, despite its flattening at the top, the legs still are asymptotic to the correct velocity. So you could still get velocity information out of those, amazingly enough. Okay. Um, and notice you can still in the con in the constant offset section, you can still get e even from these flattened hyperboloids, you might still be able to figure out where the middle of it is, and thus you have the lateral location, you know, nailed of that scatterer. All right. So we can get the lateral location. From the constant offset section, we can get the velocity from the common midpoint section, and this is why common midpoint sections are used so much because they still they give you the velocity information. You know, all through seven hundred six, we were wondering, well, how do we get the velocity? Okay, and I didn't tell you much about that. This is the this is the way it's been done. 
okay, and why CMP and CDP you know, became a standard. It's that, it's that useful. OK. Uh, you know, still can't get depth unless you can determine you have a nice hyperbol hyperbola. And so that scatter is almost directly underneath that midpoint. Uh, now look what happens uh, to the, um, you know, this is a constant off, this is a, uh, a constant velocity section, right? And these are just simple scatters. Look what happens if you uh, do the NMO correction at the correct velocity, okay? The, the, the ones that are, the, the scatters that are directly underneath the, um, directly underneath the, um, um, uh, the uh, midpoint. This is still a common midpoint section, just with NMO correction. You know, now from T to tau, I would say. Um, those, um, uh, you know, those are nicely corrected to the flat lines. Okay, the ones that are out away from the midpoint where we have this CMP, those are turning in. The flat tops are turning into these horrible U shapes, and they won't stack in. Okay. They'll be, uh, uh, you know, very badly corrected. So we're, you know, the scatters that are off to the side of that midpoint are are not going to stack in, and that that thus comes the dip filtering of the uh, of the common midpoint section. Okay, now I can't emphasize enough how important it is for you guys, as you especially as you look at your data sets. To study carefully and understand this um, this diagram, which is what these scatters look like in a um, uh, common source gather, in a common shot gather. Okay, in the and this is thus how the scat you know for constant velocity, and you know your your sections are not going to look tremendously different from this. Um, you know the the velocity is going to vary by a factor of two or three, but you can sort of bend this uh, this around to uh, accommodate that. Um, uh, it's you can understand your data much better, especially from the Great Basin, if you can understand this uh, this section. All right, the scatters that are close to the surface um, are um, are sharp uh, produce these sharper hyperboloids. You know, maybe even triangles. And note that uh, where they uh, where they're uh, close to the surface, they're close to the first arrival. Okay, that's a key observation. The ones that are deeper, they're in the interior, uh, and they are um, um, <clears throat> uh, and and they're uh, uh, more rounded. You know. Um, you know they're all uh, hyperbolas here. Uh, just some of them are are much sharper. Okay. Um, notice there's you know with random randomly placed scatters in in two D. You know there's there's lots of negative move out here. Okay, lots and lots of negative move out. All right. So uh, and and we have we have data sets that look just like this. Uh, it's really quite wonderful. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, uh, NMO correction and stacking is not going to do much for us. It's going to eliminate more than half of the of the scatters, more than half of the reflectors from our result. Okay, so this is why uh, you know this this little um, display here really tells you why it's so important to um, to understand. Where uh, your hyperbolas, hyperbolas, hyperboloids are coming from, uh, it's really helpful to understand them in the domain of the physical experiment that that was done, um, and that's the shot gather. Um, and uh, you can see that that you know pretty much any uh, any move out anywhere is is possible here. Um, so I'd. Uh, uh, I'd suggest some some close study of uh, of that uh, of that section for those of you who are working with these you know horrifying data sets that we get locally. Um, what is you know okay horrifying in one way, but uh, you know really quite wonderful in another way. If you know how to deal 
with these these move outs and these bow tied and crossing uh, hyperbola uh, legs, and you can untie all this and get you know determine velocity correctly, and you can track all of these uh, hyperbolas and hyperboloids. Then a a horrifying data set like this turns out to be an amazingly good and highly definitive data set. And it will find you what you're looking for. That's a, a very prominent lesson from the last 15, 18 years of, uh, of our work in uh, Nevada reflection. There are plenty, uh, you know, Graham can pull out plenty of data sets from, uh, um, you know, oceanic ridges that look similar. Okay, and uh, you know there's a there's a, a wealth of structure in these data sets, and it can show you what you what you are seeking. All right, in uh, let me just uh, review this now. In constant offset, the flat tops are horizontal rays. You know they're coming from um, uh, you know, they're coming along the constant offset from a shallow reflection. Uh, in constant source, the hyperbolas are not symmetric about uh, uh, g equals 0 or h equals 0, but they lie under uh, the line uh, g minus s. The magnitude of g minus s is equal to vt. They lie under that uh, first arrival triangle. Okay, There's the first arrival triangle. The ones with sharp tops are shallow. And they, they lie near that, uh, very near under that line. In constant midpoint, uh, all hyperbolas are symmetric. Uh, amazing. The flat tops are scatterers, not from scatterers, not directly under the midpoint. But to the velocity, you can determine on all of them if you can see the hyperbola legs you know, far enough. The animal correction uh, uh, assumes, scatters, uh, assumes the scatterers are directly under the midpoint. And distorts others. Okay, so now let's uh, let's take uh, the three star equation. Uh, so it's way back up here. All right, so that's the S G and T S S G T Z equation, um, and let's transform that equation to M and H space. So we still got uh, you know the M we're looking at. This is the the uh, 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 no, I'm sorry. The the m zero is is where we're observing. Uh, m is uh, a, a CMP that uh, shows us a uh, a scatterer, and uh, so uh, the transformation works out like this. T v is equal to the square root of the quantity z squared plus the quantity m minus m zero minus h squared plus uh, the uh, square root of the whole quantity z squared plus uh, um, the quantity m minus m0 plus h, and, and that quantity squared. Okay. And so the locus of the, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, this can be the equation of, uh, of uh, um, it looks kind of like the equation of an ellipse, actually. And, uh, and here, uh, let's just express it in terms of an ellipse in mh space. Okay, um, so the locus of a point arrival at some you know given constant m, given constant h, and given constant t, right? So we, we reach into our CMP gather, right? We've got this, uh, you know, and our our for so, somehow our data contains zeros everywhere except right at that point. Okay. And right at that point, we have a reflection amplitude. All right, so we have a, a, a you know a whole survey out of our whole survey out of all of our ten thousand uh, CMP gathers. They're all zero except for this one CMP gather, which contains that one point. Okay. Now, now, if we could figure out where that goes in in M and Z space, right? What what reflection can figure that can uh, uh, can create that impulse, right? Then what we've got is the impulse response, you know, of of this travel time equation um, to um, 
to one point in the data. Uh, and uh, I showed you this before in terms of uh, zero offset migration. So here, what we're getting is a is the impulse response of multi offset migration. All right. Uh, the equation that that uh, controls this, and actually that is going to become the uh, um, uh, the uh, imaging condition. For our um, um, for our multi offset migration is uh, is this simple travel time equation. It's just a version of, of what you see here. T squared times uh, v over two all squared um, is equal to the first term is uh, z squared by itself divided by the quantity one minus and then uh, h squared over uh, t squared times uh, v over two all squared. And the second term, which gets added, is uh, m minus m zero quantity squared. So um, you know that's expressing it as a as a, an ellipse in um, in in m and h space, right? So really, what we have here is uh, uh, we have constant v, um, we have constant t, we have constant h, right? We're at one. We're looking for uh, you know one uh, constant m h t. And we're getting the trajectory of this thing. We have constant m zero, right? Uh, and so we're getting a trajectory in m and z space, right? T is constant, v is constant. So that's constant. Uh, that that uh, the denominator of the first term is to the right is constant. Uh, the not the denominator of the uh, of the second term is one. So uh, that's our that's our ellipse. Okay, our variables are m and z. Okay, so um, in m and z we've got an ellipse, and um, uh, and the, it turns out the foci of the ellipse are uh, are the source location and the receiver location uh, along the m axis. Okay. Um, and you know one way of drawing an ellipse uh, uh, is uh, you know you put in two push pins, and you have a string that uh, that has uh, total length t v, right? That's the total um, that's the total uh, length of the of the path that gives you the reflection uh, time t, which is constant. So that you stretch out the string, and you put a pencil in this. Uh, in this triangle here, and you draw out, you know, the stretched out string, with the the string pinned at the uh, at the foci, and what do you get? You get an ellipse. Okay, I don't know. They still do that exercise in uh, in grade school anymore when they're teaching you about uh, ellipses. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I ever did it in grade school, but uh, I read about it. <laughs> um, Maybe only in. Uh, um, I had a spirograph, though. Yeah, so there's this kind of similar uh, concept. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, this is exactly the same way that we built up our zero offset migrations from geometric descriptions of the impulse responses of um, of migration and diffraction. Okay, so uh, I'm actually going to end on time today. Um, we're um, uh, and 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 in fact, at this moment, we now have a multi-offset migration, and this is actually my favorite method. Uh, you know, it's augmented by several uh, several things that make it better, but um, you know, now you know if you have a uh, a point. Uh, in your data, so there's, you know, let's say the strongest reflection in your whole data set. Of course, you know, data are never zero everywhere. Uh, I mean, if, if you, there's something seriously wrong, if, if if they are. But okay, you have a, a very strong reflection here. Where could that have come from? It could come from anywhere on this ellipse. All right, you know, it could be a vertical uh, reflector over here. It could be a vertical reflector over here. Could be a flat flat reflector down there, could be a forty-five degree dipping reflector over there or over there, 
Um, you know, that's uh, those are the possibilities. Uh, and if, if all you have is one data point, then that's all you can say. Okay, my reflection, my reflector, my structure is somewhere along this ellipse. And of course, for for um, um, you know, for variable velocity, it's going to be some kind of ellipsoid. It's not going to be so simple as something you could draw with a string and two push pins. Um, but but it, it really is not much more complicated than this, uh, no matter what happens. And um, uh, yeah, so so okay. There's data. You know, maybe you've got uh, the strong reflection there, there, there. More reflection. You know, there, there, there. You add the impulse responses of all those points together, and what you'll get is, um, you know, the places where they don't add constructively will 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 cancel out. Hopefully, well, especially if you uh, are uh, obtaining a data set that even has as few now as 20,000 traces at live, right? You'll get a lot of cancellation, and you'll get a lot of reinforcement of the places where the where the ellipses from the different reflections all fit together. Okay, so that's our first migration method, and so I I better stop there and let uh, let my colleague into the room.